a time, there was a wondrous city called Kenola. Most people have no idea that Kenola still exists. The people who once lived there loved it for the evergreen grass, multicolored treetops, and trickling bricks that zigzagged between houses, creating a symphony of ear-pleasing sounds. The elders had always insisted that if you are quiet enough, you can clearly hear voices coming from the bricks. The bricks flow to a waterfall that spills into Spinning Lake, the only one of its kind. This anomaly flows in a complete circle around the city. Kenola has a major flaw that caused all of its residents to abandon their lovely homes and move to cramped dwellings in the most populous city in the country, often called the Great City. What's the flaw? Anarella asked her dad. Bedtime stories are told with the intention of helping you fall asleep, her father said. Sorry, she said pulling the covers up to her neck. When Anarella was settled, Mr. McTracer started his story again. The people who lived in Kenola traveled from a distant land called Morocco. They settled in Kenola because Spinning Lake separates it from the overly crowded city. Every house in Kenola faced away from the city. All was well until some odd occurrences occurred. Fezbridge, the only way of crossing the lake by car, foot, or bicycle, collapsed and was swept away. The sun repositioned itself. It rose in the north and set in the south. Then the great compass at the end of Main Street went bonkers. The magnetic needle started spinning in a counterclockwise direction. Something terrible was amidst. No one knew what was happening to the little city, but they all agreed that they must leave. The families gathered their most important belongings and crossed the lake in small boats. They were so frightened that they left behind automobiles, fine clothing, and precious jewelry. Some of our neighbors are direct descendants of the Moroccan people who settled there. Great story, Dad. Good night, sweetness. Good night, said Anarella. Anarella fell into a deep slumber with thoughts of the city of Kenola and the people who once lived there. She dreamt of tiny people with the ability to breathe underwater, living in the bricks. The houses were the same color as the silt beneath the water, so they were perfectly camouflaged. Anarella squirmed when her dream changed to an unpleasant vision. Mom! Anarella yelled before she realized that she had been dreaming. She had dreamt that same dream many times after her mother was deployed. She hoped her outcry had not disturbed her dad. Anarella talked with her mother through video chat most mornings. But it was not the same as having her at home. She wanted to hug her mother. She missed her a lot. So did her dad. He tried to hide it, but Anarella sensed that he felt lonely. Take care of your father until I get back, her mother had instructed. Remembering her mother's request, Anarella did her best to be good. With happy thoughts of her mother, Anarella's mind settled, and she quickly fell asleep. The following morning, Anarella woke to the aromas of cinnamon buns and bacon. She took a deep breath and then sat up. Dad, she called, I want grits. Sorry, sugar pill. We're out. How about oats? Out of oats too, he said. How about eggs? Anarella strolled into the kitchen. She pulled a chair out, scrubbing the wooden floor. Eggs without grits. No thank you. I'm sorry honey plum, he said. The world will bounce back before you know it. It always does. Has this happened before? Yes. There have been many plagues and viruses before this one. We must be careful though. It's airborne. The news says it isn't. The news outlets never reveal everything at once. Your mom and I can access things that are not publicly shared. What kind of things? Anarella asked. You already know the answer to that question. I know, Dad. You share on a need-to-know basis, she quoted. Good girl. I want to join the army someday. That's new. I thought you wanted to be a ballerina and a teacher. I do. 
I also want to know secret army stuff. Annarella looked over at two similar pictures that had been there for as long as she could remember. She gasped and ran over for a closer look. Her parents had visited the same location at different times of the year to take a selfie. In each of the pictures, the east side of one Vanderbilt could clearly be seen in the background. But something was different in each. In the picture on the left, the houses faced forward. In the picture on the right, the houses were turned backward. I can't believe it, she said walking back to her chair. Is that what I think it is? No. She shrieked, Kenola is real. Your grandmother's name is Rashida McTracer. Her parents lived in Kenola before she was born. No. Anarella was still in disbelief. Can we go? I suppose. Maybe we can get close enough for a photo, but we cannot cross the lake. Why not? It's protected. Protected, she asked. From what? Plans were in place to turn the city into a theme park. They were going to call it Kenola Pass. Then the world went crazy. I'm tired of wearing masks. I don't like the six-foot rule. I hate this virus. Anarella shouted anxiously. Hang in there. Someday, you'll tell your children about the great toilet paper shortage. Anarella stared at the floor and pouted. She had never thought so far into the future. What's wrong Pumpling? asked Mr. McTracer. Does mom know how to fight? Of course. It's her job. And she's very good at it, he said. I'll worry about her. Don't worry about your mom. Somebody better be worried about the bad guys because Kirsty McTracer is the best in her unit. Mr. McTracer's answer made Annarella feel better and she was back to her perky self in no time. Can we go to Kenola? she asked. How about ice cream instead? Annarella wanted an adventure. She had been inside for too long. I'd rather get ice cream on the way. Mr. McTracer threw his hands up and smiled, you win. I might be able to talk the guards into letting us in. When they arrived, an armed guard wearing black and green fatigues told them that the area was off limits. This is protected territory, he stated. When they were back in the car, Mr. McTracer asked, Are you okay? I'm okay. It's time to write another letter to Mom. Annarella liked that her favorite wall was partially open. She looked forward to the day that she could ditch the mask, hug her friends and breathe around strangers. That's my girl, her father said proudly. After an hour of driving around the city, Mr. McTracer found a parking space on Bowery Street. I ordered takeout, he said. It should be ready by now. It only took three minutes for Mr. McTracer to pop in and out of Wefang number one Chinese restaurant. Since many people were still afraid to leave their homes, there were no other customers. I smell shrimp. Annarella said when her father returned. Your snout is right, piglet, he replied. Mr. McTracer drove for a few blocks and pulled into a public parking lot. Zakoti Park. Annarella announced happily. The park was unusually quiet. They did not have to cover their food or wear their masks because they were the only visitors to the park. Where is everyone? Annarella asks after taking her last bite of battered shrimp rice. Mr. McTracer did not answer. His attention was on a group of older boys whose street clothes resembled the uniform of the Kenola Pass Guard. He gathered their trash and stuffed it inside the bag. Let's go, he ordered. Annarella noticed the seriousness of her dad's voice. She did not ask why he left the bag on the table or why they could not stay to feed the squirrels. She grabbed his hand and his arm to make it easy for him to pick her up if he needed to. Mr. Mac Tracer pointed his key fob. A second before he pressed the unlock button, someone hurled a brick, leaving a large crack in the back window of his car. That's not a police car. Someone in the crowd shouted. Police or military? It's all the same to me, the brick thrower returned. 
stick to the rules or you'll be dealt with, the leader of the mob shouted. No military property. Mr. McTracer walked calmly. When he reached to open the door, the leader of the protesters approached him and asked, Whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? My heart bleeds for Mr. Floyd, Mr. McTracer answered. I am sorry about the damage to your car, so my brother owns a shop. He will take care of it. The man handed Mr. McTracer a crumpled card, then ordered his followers to move along. The man's expression became even more serious when he turned to speak to Mr. McTracer again. There are many groups out. Your daughter should be at home, he warned. Justice for Mr. Floyd. They shouted over and over as they marched towards their destination. We're safe, Mr. McTracer told Anarella. Fasten your seatbelt, he said before driving slowly down the street. Many of the protesters walked in front of traffic without regard for their own safety, holding hand-painted signs high above their heads. Mr. McTracer turned onto Baker Street and found that another group of protesters was not letting anyone pass. Call the secret number, Dad. I'm scared, Anarella said. Stay calm, Anarella. That number is for extreme emergencies only. The police are on the way. Mr. McTracer removed his seatbelt. What are you doing? I'll only be gone a few minutes, he promised. It's a peaceful protest. I'm going to talk to who's in charge so we can drive through. It won't take long. Anarella looked over at the car parked next to her. The woman in the driver's seat held a small infant. It was obvious that her father was helping others as well. Thanks for being brave, Peanut, he said. They are letting us through. The drive home lasted several hours because the number of protesters continued to grow. The last bit of sunlight disappeared just as Mr. McTracer drove into the garage. Mr. McTracer went to the kitchen to start dinner. Anarella was quite interested in the protesters. She wondered if they would venture into her neighborhood. She pulled a curtain back and waited. After several minutes of silence, she decided to help her dad with dinner. As soon as she closed the curtain, Anarella heard barking. That was strange. Pets are not allowed in her neighborhood. She pulled the curtain back again. A tall man in a long coat was holding a red leash. What a wonderful pet! I want one, she whispered. She watched as the man uttered a few words and knelt to unbuckle the collar and free the animal. He dropped the leash and walked away. Dad! Come look at this! Mr. McTracer did not answer. Dad, she called again. There was no time to waste. Anarella rushed outside. She could not believe what she saw. It was not a puppy. It was a fennec fox. Come here, girl, Anarella said. I won't hurt you. The little fox ran up to Anarella at an amazing pace. You're a good girl. Aren't you? Anarella lifted the fox up and asked, Why did that man leave you? I could no longer control him. That was a weird thing for the little fennec to say. So Anarella had to ask, What does that mean? Before the fox answered, Anarella realized something. You talk? Yes. I talk. But only to young ones. You never talk to your owner. That man was not my owner. He offered me food. This fennec fox was from Kenola Pass. She could talk to children, but she could not control them. The man had taken her away from Kenola. Away from her family. When she woke, she had no idea where she was. The man took her out of the cage and attached a leash to control her. She looked up at him and her eyes twinkled. When they walked down the avenue, it was she that had led the way. What is your name? Anarella asked. I am Phonix. I get it, said Anarella. New York Fox. I must return to Kenola, said Phonix. Kenola? 
as in Kenola Pass. Anarella could not hold her excitement. Yes, my dad can take you there. Adults cannot be trusted. My dad is trustworthy. I see, said Phonix. You're afraid. I'll find another child who is brave enough to help me. Phonix jumped from Anarella's arms and walked down the street. Wait. I'm brave. I'll help you. We must go now. Phonix stopped at the leash and waited for Anarella to attach it. There are a lot of bad people out tonight, said Anarella. This is the escape that you wanted, said Phonix. Are you ready? Anarella was thrilled. I'm ready, she said. As soon as she took hold of the leash, her hand went invisible. Then her arm. And in a few seconds, her entire body was invisible. Don't let go, said Phonix. Phonix disappeared. And finally, the leash was invisible as well. Anarella felt a gentle tug on the leash, so she squeezed a little tighter. She had not taken a single step, but in an instant, Anarella found herself at the end of the street. How? she asked. Mr. and Mrs. Bells were unloading multiple packages of toilet paper from their station wagon. From there, she moved effortlessly through the city. And she was quite certain that she had passed right through some buildings as well as people. A few moments later, Anarella and Phonix were standing in front of the Kenola guard. Will he let us in? asked Anarella. He cannot see you, replied Phonix. But I'm no longer invisible, said Anarella holding her hands in front of her face. You are invisible to the guard. Sure enough, the guard did not notice them. How? Anarella asked again. The little fox did not reply. She stopped and scratched her neck. When Anarella knelt to remove the collar and leash, she spoke softly. When I first saw you, I thought you would make a great pet. Will you be my friend? Always, said Phonix. I want you to meet my family. The water of Spinning Lake was just as her father described. It moved too fast to swim across. Anarella noticed that there was no bridge. How do we cross? We walk. On water. It's an illusion created to protect us. Okay. How do we cross the illusion? There is no lake. Only sand, said Phonix. You're not afraid to walk across the sand, are you? The water stopped moving and instantly turned to sand. As soon as they crossed the circle of sand, the water appeared. How? asked Anarella. That's the magic of Kenola. Imagine it, and it comes true. Kenola was beautiful. The sky was teal blue, and the grass was bright green. Why did you need me? Anarella asked. You wanted adventure. My parents will worry. Your parents will never know. I am missing. They will know. You can always go back to when. What? What is another story? replied Phonix. I don't understand. I'll show you. Close your eyes and think of the moment you first saw me. Anarella closed her eyes. When she opened them, she was back in her home looking through the window. You called. Mr. McTracer asked. Someone left a leash in the road, she said. We had better not touch it, Mr. McTracer advised. When Anarella went to her room, she found the leash on her bed. She understood what Phonix meant when she said you can always go back to when. One day, she would go back to when she crossed Spinning Lake and visit her new friend.